This is Digital Music Trends, a legal special recorded at South by Southwest 2014. DMT's coverage of South by Southwest is brought to you by Omniphone, the leading B2B cloud music provider powering global music services including Sony Music Unlimited, Guvera, Rara and Sirius XM. Find out more on Omniphone.com and by Music Graph, the world's first knowledge engine for music, available as a consumer app and as a graph API for developers. Check out MusicGraph.com or Developer.MusicGraph.com. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends Legal Special from South by Southwest 2014. Whilst in Austin, I recorded a few fascinating interviews addressing the hottest legal and legislative issues in the music space, especially focused on the US, so I thought I'd bundle them all together into one episode. In this show, you're going to hear from Lethal Rosario, president of Wise Girl Entertainment. We cover termination rights, their potential effect, ongoing legal disputes in the area, and I ask her thoughts about the review of the Copyright Act. I also chat with Ken Abdo, vice president at Lomen Abdo. We cover the issues around digital royalty rates for new and heritage artists, his panel about interactive music applications and the potential for new licensing frameworks. We also discuss his take on Beats Music paying the same rate to all rights holders and the current saga around ASCAP and BMI's rates. Then comes my chat with Paul M. Fackler, partner at Arendt Fox LLP, and with him we discuss the history of rate courts in the US, compulsory rates, sustainability, selective withdrawal, and the issues around pre-1972 recordings. And finally, I chat with Greg Barnes, the General Counsel and the Director of Governmental Affairs at DEMA, the Digital Media Association. We discuss the Copyright Act review, the rates battles, the Global Repertoire Database and Section 115. And aside from editing out a few of the loud beeps uh, that came from the Austin tram cars uh, that were getting in the way of the recording sometimes because we were recording for the most part on the uh, Austin Convention Center's balcony, uh, I haven't edited the interviews at all. This is because I know that all these subjects are quite complex and require exhaustive explanations uh, because otherwise you know it could be it could lead to a misleading answer essentially so uh, I really hope you enjoyed this episode even if it is quite long you can uh, go on digitalmusictrends.com and uh, find all the links to download it if you're currently on YouTube or on a streaming media and you have to stop at any given point and on the site you can also find all the links uh, to my normal shows uh, which come out weekly and uh, cover all the latest news in the digital music industry as well as the hottest companies in the field. Uh, thanks so much for listening and I really hope you enjoy this show. Hello everyone and welcome to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and I am here with uh, uh, Lita Rosario from uh, Wise uh, Girl Entertainment uh, where you are an attorney uh, of course. Uh, and so hi Lita and thanks for joining me, how's it going? Fine, how are you? It's great to be here Andrea. Uh, it's great to have you here and so uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, uh, so what is Wise Girl Entertainment all about and uh, sure. uh, where you come from? Sure, um, I'm an attorney by profession and um, I started out actually my my career as a corporate securities lawyer and uh, by happenstance my roommate in college was Crystal Waters oh, wow. and I <laughs> negotiated Crystal's uh, first recording contract with the Basement Boys back in the late 80s um, early 90s along with a colleague of mine who went to law school with me who was actually practicing entertainment law um, I got him to help out and that was kind of my first um, you know venture into entertainment law um, and after that I ended up co-owning a record label in um, Washington DC that produced Drew Hill and Maya and of course Cisco yeah. and so that's how I got started out um, I went on to represent Missy Elliott Tank and many other artists songwriters producers and others and um, currently I'm working with George Clinton and the estate of Gary Scheider diaper man from Parliament Funkadelic um, assisting them with their uh, copyright terminations and yeah. otherwise with royalty collection. Um, I successfully helped Africa Bambata and Soul Sonic Force get back their copyrights last year. Um, and so I'm on a mission to help as many yeah. artists <laughs> as possible recover their rights and recover any royalties that are owed to them. Absolutely. And so let's talk about termination rights. I, I did sure. a, a piece last year here South by uh, around termination rights, but uh, can you just explain to the viewers uh, uh, really briefly uh, what, what the issues are? 
all about? Sure. Um, termination rights um, are a right, a statutory right, a right that's given under the Copyright Act of 1976, um, Section 203 of the Act, for works that are created after 19, uh, January 1, 1978. Yeah. Uh, well, well, actually, works that are transferred, that the rights are transferred after January 1, 1978, um, 35 years hence, they are allowed to basically send notices to whomever the current owners of their copyrights are and recapture their copyrights. Yeah. Um, the It's a limited uh, right because it affects only U.S., so it doesn't actually affect them in the rest of the world, yeah. although a lot of people feel a lot of attorneys and you know others or solicitors, etc., outside of the U.S. and the U.K. and in Europe and the EU in general think that there might be a way to kind of bootstrap what happens in the U.S. because if the contract gave rights all around the world, yeah. there might be a right to terminate around the world, but probably there would have to be some lawsuits over in the in the EU in order to secure that. But yeah. for sure, for the U.S., it's a way for songwriters and recording artists to recapture their rights. Um, for works that are made pre uh, or were transferred pre-January 1, 1978. It's actually a longer period. It's a 56-year period, so they have a longer wait to go. And um, they're and also the, older, which is not helpful. <laughs> exactly. And those rights are actually technically called renewal rights. They're right. under Section 304 of the Act. Um, but if the, if the author passed away in the first 28 years of the term, the heirs actually have an immediate right to take those rights back. So don't just assume that because you your works are pre-78 that you don't have any rights or you have to wait a long right. time. You should still seek counsel of an attorney or someone who's knowledgeable on uh, terminations and renewals to see if you can actually secure your rights and get your rights back. So sure. this yeah. has uh, potentially a revolutionary effect on um, artists' rights and artists' ability to you know, have ownership of their masters and their musical Absolutely. compositions and to license them to you know, independence and to a whole bunch of people that the major labels and other labels are unwilling to license them to and just sure. open up a door for them to start to get real compensation for their works because many of them are stuck in recording contracts and 35 years later the recording companies are still saying they're hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars unrecouped and still not entitled to any royalties even though their music is being exploited all over the internet it's being exploited still being sold hard copy cds download streaming um, and all other kinds of uses in movies and tv shows and they're not getting any compensation it's insane and so looking at uh, uh, how it's um, it's evolved uh, so that the the uh, termination right uh, really started uh uh, last year, uh, yeah. Well, the uh, earliest, sure. The, the earliest, earliest that um, an artist could terminate for, or uh, an author, for someone whose works were transferred uh, after January one seventy eight was two thousand thirteen. Right. The latest date that they have for that, it's a five year window, so it's two thousand eighteen. But right. there has to be a minimum of two years notice to the current owner. So that means two thousand sixteen is a drop dead date. Yeah. for works created in 1978. So it's important. I'm so happy that you're doing this. It's important that authors, and this applies to book authors or fine artists. It applies to wow, any I types know, of I, I art. Didn't, I didn't realize that. Exactly. Any type of rights that are cover, covered under the Copyright wow. Act. So book authors, fine artists, photographers, um, photographers, magazine, I guess. Exactly. Photographers and even other like graphic artists. There's an interesting uh, twist on this because for instance let's just take Nike as a hypothetical I don't know what artists actually created their logo yeah. but those artists who created logos for trademarks if they transferred their rights and it wasn't a work made for hire they can actually seek to recover their rights as well wow. so it's very far reaching it has very far reaching Im implications um, and certainly um, for the artists who maybe retain their publishing or for one reason or another own their rights and did never transfer them to a label or to a third party but let's say they license the rights for it to be used in a movie or they licensed it for a tv commercial yeah. they can also terminate and get those rights back and for instance if it's in a movie the film company has no other choice but to, to renew it. to renew <laughs> and to pay a new fee 
Oh gosh. So, that, this, so that's, is, this is this is a and, wide reach. Exactly. Wide reach and you should never do it in perpetuity. If you're if and for, for artists who do get their rights back, the one thing they should remember, or two things they should remember is that they should not resell them to anyone. They should keep them. It's a pension. Yeah. The royalties, the the income, what it represents is a way, you know, in the US now, because you know, finally we joined the rest of <laughs> the industrialized world and extended copyright to life plus seventy years. That means it's your life if you're the author, yeah. plus a couple of generations after you who can earn money off of your creative work. So it's very important not to do a whole transfer and sell all the rights off again. Yeah. If you do anything, license it for a period of time, five years, 10 years, probably at the max. Um, but, but it's, it's also good uh, as, an, as, a, as an estate for, for your exactly. spouse or your children or anything exactly, like that. Exactly, exactly, for your heirs, exactly. So it's inheritance rights. So yeah. it's it's very important and um, I think in general uh, creative people are more open to new technologies and to working with independent companies yeah. independent filmmakers and independent TV and video producers have a very hard time licensing rights to popular music because yeah. major labels just want too much money the major publishers they want too much money they're not flexible enough to agree to things even that would pay you know out on a royalty basis sure and looking at uh, uh, you know, we're talking about whether last year the debate was whether there would be any counter legal actions from labels or any dilly dallying yes. on, on getting this yes. action. So, so what is what is what is happening there? Are you seeing good well, results? Well, um, there's been a couple of lawsuits. Um, one which involved the pre seventy eight works was the Bob Marley estate lawsuit, um, and unfortunately, the judge in New York and federal court in New York ruled that the works were works made for hire. We didn't talk about that quietly, but there's a little twist on termination because they're if, trying to make them yes pass. if they were if the works were works made for hire then you don't have a right of termination right. so but there's a supreme court case in the united states that says that um a work isn't a work for hire just because it says so on a contract that the author actually had to be an employee or yeah. the works have to be enumerated in Section 101 of the Copyright Act, which master recordings and musical compositions are not listed there. Neither are books, neither are, you know, prints for fine artists. Yeah. Um, TV and film is included. So TV and unfortunately... People, creative people who have done TV and film work don't have termination rights because right. they are considered works made for hire. Sure. But they the, probably had a salary as well. Exactly, exactly. So they've been paid, so it's a little different. Yeah. Um, but for in the Bob Marley case, even though Chris Blackwell himself testified that he did not intend Bob Marley's works to be works made for hire, <laughs> Universal <laughs> argued that they were, and the judge ruled on summary judgment, meaning without a jury, that they were works made for hire. Wow. Um, Bob Marley's estate filed a, uh, an appeal and they settled and the set, the settlement is under seal. So we don't know actually what happened. I'm sure he, they got paid money, whether or not they got any of the ownership rights. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, the other case was the village people case, yeah. um, which was out in California. Um, and in that case, um, the court successfully ruled that in the village people's case, number one, that they weren't that the songs that were done by the village people were not works made for hire. Right. But the court also ruled that if there's something kind of quirky in, in the copyright ad in, in Section 203 that says that all of the um, grantors. A majority of the grantors have to consent to the termination and sign the termination notice. Yeah. However, that court clarified that if only one grantor has signed the agreement, then only that one grantor need terminate. So, right. for instance, with the village people, each one of them signed a separate music publishing agreement so each one of them separately can terminate without the other members yeah. so that was very significant there's actually a trial coming up as well in that case um in april i believe april or may on the last issue that's left in that case which is whether or not a manager was given 
part ownership of the copyright, even though he didn't actually write any of the songs. Okay. And so uh -huh. they're they're trying to terminate his interest as well. So that's actually going to trial. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, and more recently, I just um, argued effectively a case out of the 11th Circuit in the United States uh, federal court, which is Florida, covers Florida, Georgia, um, and Alabama, I believe, maybe Mississippi too, um, just a ruling that um, the courts have federal, that the federal courts have jurisdiction to determine whether or not these termination notices are actually ripe for review by a court, even before the effective date of termination. Right. Because you have to give two notice. to ten years notice as long as the copyright office has yeah. actually received the filing and they've accepted the filing and sent you back your formal um, record. You know, you have to record these notices with the copyright office. Yeah. So as long as that has happened, the courts can review the validity of those notices. So that was an important decision as well. So one of the things that uh, I was covering was the copyright uh, review, not reform review of, uh, from uh, Maria Polante uh, last year. Year for other world uh, creator summit uh, yes. and uh, so that was quite a fresh thing back then yes. but as uh, you know we all know that the Obama administration has had a, a number of things to deal with so has anything happened on that front or is that going to um, be just that in the water no that's still up um, you know Congress there were some hearings recently on reform of the Copyright Act in general and this question of termination has come up now of course the record companies music publishing companies book publishers they all want to limit the rights more and more yeah. so they there's got to be some strong artist lobby to make sure that those rights are actually enforced. And that's what we'll be talking about the panel here at South by Southwest this week. Yeah. We'll be talking about that and, and trying to make sure that, you know, the artist rights are properly represented and that if there are amendments that they're amended in a way that are beneficial to creators and not in a way that's only beneficial to the publishers and the record companies. Of course, because we know there's, there's lobbies in, 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 in these things and, uh, you know, there's uh, representatives from the tech industry that want something to happen and exactly. representatives from the artist industries that, of course, uh, have more I guess, of a voice uh, if they come together. Uh, yes. But they need to come together for that. Yes, they're going to have to come together for that. So hopefully we will be able to get a group of artists together who can come forward and testify. And I think one of the, the legislative history of Section 203 talks about how one of the reasons for termination rights is so that artists get a second bite at the apple, that yeah. they didn't have really an opportunity to have an arm's length negotiation when they originally signed the rights away because most of them are not discovered yet their works haven't been published yet and no one knows the true value of them yeah and um, particularly with the record companies the recruitment structure as I said many of these artists 20 30 years later the labels are still saying there are hundreds of thousands if not millions of dollars unrecouped yeah which seems absolutely incredible <laughs> it's it's and most really artists don't have the finances to actually to fight that to fight that exactly yeah. to fight it and um, you know basically they're kind of in the equivalent of a sharecropping situation because the recruitment that the labels are saying is not repaid a lot of that is the cost to actually make the records so while they're charging the artist for the cost to make the record out of their royalty which typically in the United States on an album is about a dollar and 15 cents yeah uh, before the various deductions and things that they take so they're charging all that ch cost over to the artist royalty account so why shouldn't the artist own it at the end of <laughs> Day. It only makes good sense. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Especially after so many years, and and we know that if an artist uh, is still unrecouped uh, after this long of a time, they probably found another career path, and they may or not be able to ask for some sort of accounting or, or, exactly. or, or, or looking at the books. And, it's, and not only that, it's difficult because um, we have statutes of limitation in the U.S. and typically yeah. the statute of limitations are less than 10 years. In most states, they're three to six years. That's as far back as you can go if you haven't gotten an accounting. Yeah. You can't go back to inception and get them to actually prove an account for how they come up with these ridiculous unrecouped balances. So yeah. termination rights are really important.
important. Perfect. Well, uh, it was a real pleasure talking to you. And uh, I'm sure if people want to know more, can they follow you? Are you on Twitter? Do, do you have oh, a, a social media presence? I'm, of, of I'm sorry, I don't have a big social <laughs> media presence. But you do um, have a, a website. I do. My website is wyzgirl, G-I-R-L dot com. And there's actually quite a bit of uh, information on there on what you do and lots of resources. So I'm sure people can find out yes. uh, a lot more on the website. And, right. Or, and, uh, mm -hmm, or if you need some help, you need a representative to help you terminate, I'm certainly there to help for that reason. I'm working on a lot of them now. I'm working on, as I said, Parliament Funkadelic. I'm working on Peaches and Herb um, and numerous others that are, are up. That's fantastic. Well, thanks, Lita. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find everything on digitalmusictrans.com and the videos on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrans. Hello everyone and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to welcome Ken Abdo, the chair of uh, Lohman Abdo Law Firm uh, from uh, Minneapolis. So hi Ken and thanks for joining me. How's it going? I'm going very well, thank you. Good to be here in Austin with you. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's great talking to you. Uh, I thought your profile was super interesting from, from the South by schedule so mm. I had to get you, uh, get you here and get an interview. Hope I don't disappoint you. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I want to start with your background. So you have been a, a music lawyer for uh, over 25 years and uh, uh, but you didn't start in music law so how did you make that transition well I'm, I'm actually celebrating my 30th year as a music wow. lawyer so giving my age away but I started out I was a musician that's what I did for a living I was a uh, singing drummer uh, a songwriter guitar player piano player and that's what I thought I was going to do for a living was to be a performing artist um, I was a very good entertainer I was not really an artist, and I realized that my vocation was probably in counseling artists and not performing as one. Right. Sure. And so, uh, you know, you uh, uh, are based in Minneapolis, uh, which is a, a great city, but it's also not the usual city, you know, for, for a music law firm. You, do, you always think of LA and New York. So, how have you found that experience of, of building a firm up uh, over there, and, uh, and how is the scene down there? Yeah. It, it's been a, a rare and unique um, accomplishment to create a full-time entertainment law firm in Minneapolis, and we have 11 lawyers that work in the intellectual property and entertainment space, with five of us working full-time in the entertainment space, which makes us one of the largest uh, firms, well, in the Midwest for sure. I think we may be the largest. And um, this was primarily uh, built by myself and uh, by, with the support of my firm and then the colleagues that we hired uh, on uh, as the years went by. But one thing that's nice is when you're an, one of the only firms in the Midwest, then you are also a go-to uh, firm for people in that area. And talent is comes from everywhere. Talent yeah. doesn't come from the coasts exclusively. Yeah. So yeah, sure. there's a lot of opportunity to work with developing talent. And as many of us know in the Midwest, especially during the winters, there's not a lot to do except for play your instruments and to focus on your art. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And so uh, looking at, you know, over the last 30 years, you must have seen a, a complete sea change in the music mm -hmm. industry. So do, do you have uh, specific, uh, you know, lawyers that are specialized in digital right now? Or uh, do, do you all deal with uh, the whole uh, the whole 360 degree of, of what's, what's going on? Well, we started out working, as you know, and still do primarily working with content creators, yeah. writers, authors uh, in, in music. And when we started our practice, we were squarely in the analog era. And we evolved along with the technology that brought us into the digital area and digital products. And now we have to be educated in, in, the, in the world of, of uh, online uh, streaming, online subscriptions. Um, basically, the economy, we have completely are moving now, and I think irrevocably, to an economy of licensing and subscribing to music, not buying it to own it. Sure. So, we, we follow, we follow the, the technologies as much as law does. You know, law really has always chased technology. Yeah. And now we are uh, a part of that learning curve as well. Yeah, sure. And uh, I guess uh, a, a big part of the debate today in streaming services uh, terms is the fact that a lot of the heritage artists that are uh, out there with the uh, sort of antiquated deals uh, are not getting their fair share of, of, of revenues from the labels when it comes to, to, to the repartition of the royalties. Right. So uh, are, you, are you trying to be, uh, you know, are you being quite hardcore when it comes to new artist contracts and streaming rates and how much your artists should be getting from, from back from the labels? Interesting that you would um, identify heritage artists and we represent quite a few. And 
deceased artists and their estates. The good news is they have such a place in the lexicon of music that they that their music is still desirable. Yeah. It's still on radio. It's it is streamed. It is licensed. Okay, so there's a lot of opportunity for those hits. Yeah. Going forward, the new artists they don't have that economy to rely on. They have to they have to launch from a spot of where there is uh, no uh, there is no analog or physical economy so it's a much different trajectory in their career so we yeah. are yes very protective in making sure that our heritage artists get the benefit of the new um, digital stream uh, digital sources of music but even more importantly, making sure that our new artists are not lo losing money or leaving money on by table. not collecting or being you know, proactive about the collection of their works. Yeah, and there's like a, a ton of different uh, uh, you know, income revenues as well that come from all these different services. Right. And when you're looking at YouTube, there's a ton of little pockets of income that uh, should be not left uh, unturned, right? That's exactly what the economy has gone to. There are a number of buckets, digital buckets, a penny here, a fractional penny here, five cents there. You know, They all have to be collected. Otherwise, it doesn't add up to be a career. Yeah, and let's talk about your, your panel here. Uh, you know, it's called the Use and Abuse of Interactive Music Application. So that's a field that interests me a lot mm. because uh, I actually used to work for a, a company that worked in interactive music as well. So, mm. uh, and, and it's, it's kind of a weird field that we've seen a lot of companies come and go. It's been tough for anybody to really create your, you know, remixing applications, for example, that uh, took off or, uh, you know, it's a difficult licensing framework around that. So uh, what do you think is the situation now with interactive uh, uh, music applications? Have you seen any, any interesting or exciting companies or developments lately? Well, I think what I find most interesting is that there is a genuine effort now to license music and be able to access music interactively and non-interactively as well online. So um, the, the bad news is that it's a complicated procedure and it's an expensive procedure and the people who control the content, it's not so much the artists but their representatives, their record companies, their publishing companies um, are working to you know, standardize and come up with an uh, with a economic model that is affordable by the startups and yet delivers um, meaningful money uh, to the content owners. Yeah, yeah sure. And, and looking at that uh, side of things, uh, do you think that there is a space here to create uh, a new set of, of, of licenses which are not uh, purely sync uh, licenses for games, uh, but are also not purely streaming licenses, but uh, you know, encompass a broader range of catalogs so that services that do come in that have, a, that have a, an idea in that, in that sphere can license uh, a broader range of music rather than just doing one, one of deals on single tracks. Absolutely. If you look in the past, there were um, protocols and customs with respect to the licensing of music um, in you know for for broadcast, terrestrial broadcast, right. for for um, uh, you know other applications, mechanical licenses, and so forth. They were long established. They were predictable. Okay, the platforms were fewer, yep. but but they were predictable. Going forward, one of the challenges is that there are so many different platforms where music is used in different ways. Yeah. The parameters of the use, the length of the use, the amount of, uh, of um, uh, you know, the terms of the use are so varied depending on the platform. It needs to be standardized. It needs to be predictable, not only for the businesses so they can count on what they're going to have to pay, but also for the, the rights holders so they can get a sense of what yeah. that's going to pay them. Yeah, sure. Because uh, we've seen a lot of uh, you know ad rev shares, and those are not predictable. You know, you give your music out, and then you don't right. know what you're going to get back. Right. So I would have to say, as an artist advocate, I would be most interested in making sure that as much money as could could be made as possible to get to the artist, knowing that there are intermediaries. There's record companies in the middle. There are publishing companies in the middle yeah. we get our monies often through them. And you know, it, frankly, it'd be great to be as if you could circumnavigate <laughs> that and be get, go directly, it might even be better. But yeah. there just needs to be um, there needs to be, it needs to be predictable. It needs to be clean. It needs to be something that uh, that actually delivers meaningful income to both sides of the transaction. Sure, and we're seeing an increasing number of uh, streaming services actually. Uh, have uh, APIs out there that uh, allow third-party companies to access the music that is, uh, you know, is uh, present on the streaming service uh, in their own applications. So uh, we've seen a lot of playlisting apps, for example, that do that, uh, and there were recommendation services. Uh, Beats is launching their uh, API today. Uh, uh, Spotify is, is, you know, you know, you have loads of apps now that you can just uh, launch and they let you sign in through your Spotify account so you can listen to music. But we've seen also an increasing use of music in a non strictly just purely streaming way so for example there's there's a, a new app uh, um, 
that allows you to remix uh, tracks on Spotify via Spotify account, uh, which uh, uh, arguably is, is a bit more than the pure streaming license. So, so how do you see those boundaries being pushed, and, and, and do you think that there might be a pushback from the rights holders on, on that front? Oh, I think that it's gonna that the response is gonna be, be very uh, diverse. I think there are certain rights rights holders that would be interested in in having their fans remix the music. Right now, if it's for their, but the question becomes, and I should say, there are those that would not want that to happen. It's like you know moral rights, you know, right? And uh, that in Europe, you can't really mess with the integrity of a a piece of art. Yeah, sure. And. Uh, this would allow that, of course, if the if the rights holder grants it. But if they do grant it, then I think that there's a, a whole different business there. Now, the use yeah. of that of that use of those remixes or you know recreations probably would be fairly limited. I don't know as a rights holder we would say, oh, you can remix something and then redistribute it. Yeah, you know? yeah sure. Yeah. It might be for you to have fun in a private way to do that and, and use privately, fine. But um, Clearly, it can be done. Yeah. I mean, clearly, it's happening already, you yeah, know. Yeah, and so, sure. we've learned, for example, in America, you, we've learned that <clears throat> when it came to illegal downloads, the, 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 the recording industry's response was to sue all the end users. There yeah, were 50,000 sure. 50, lawsuits. Well, that's not a good public relations move, and it really didn't change anything. There still is illegal downloading. Yeah. So, when technology allows fans to do different things with the content, I think we should learn from the past and say, let's embrace that. Yeah. Let's embrace that. Let's make it legal. Let's make it interactive. Let's make it a relationship building, and let's make some money in the you know in the process. Not a not a, a, a prohibitive amount. Yeah. That, but something that would be fair. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And, and I should point out actually that and all of these applications allow you to record any of these things. It's just a way to mess around essentially with the right. with the track. So it's uh, definitely in, in that sense they are definitely staying within the the, the boundaries of the licensing uh, agreements. And uh, looking at uh, uh, you know services that are coming into the fold now, uh, talked about Beats, uh, uh, the first streaming service on a large scale that comes in and says, look, we want to give artists uh, uh, their fair share. I want everybody to have the same uh, rates, uh, uh, which is a quite a unique perspective and mm. surprising that they managed to get those deals done. Although there's a big hand in Universal in that, so uh, you know, what what do you think? Do you think that we're going to see more streaming services adopt this model? Of course, Spotify is a big black box because uh, we all know that uh, different labels have different deals and at different rates. Uh, so, uh, what's your take on that? Well, I think the concept of a compulsory a com compulsory license in America has been established for a long time on the songwriting side, yeah. where you would know. You, you can use the, the composition and you will pay this amount of money. Why not use that as a precedent in thinking through the use of, of licensing across the board? A compulsory rate, you know, that you don't have to get permission per se. You know, you can go ahead and do it subject to these payments and then there's a way to police the use and a, and a way to collect it. You know, I, I think that that precedent would be helpful in, in this new digital economy. And, and talking about rates, uh, uh, you know, one of the subjects that I've been covering on the show uh, is a bit more technical, requires a bit more explanation on that, <laughs> on that front, is that of, uh, of uh, the, the, the rate saga between ASCAP, BMI, uh, the, you know, the, the withdrawal of digital rights from, mm -hmm. from those societies, and of course, the Pandora in the background, because that's sort of the, the big bugbear that is causing all this noise, is the fact that people want to get better deals with Pandora than they currently have at the moment. So, uh, what's your take? Uh, you know, my personal take was that you know, I I am kind of skeptical of uh, big publishers withdrawing their catalogs because then the bargaining power of the of the independents and smaller players becomes much less. Uh, but at the same time, you know, there's practicality practicalities involved in that. So, what's your take? Well, it's a little bit like union busting, right? Yeah. And uh, and that, as you said, takes away from the negotiating leverage of the organizations that are established. To, to assist the songwriters. I mean, ASCAP, the members own the company. So, yeah. um, you know, it, it takes away from the leverage. And I think that what will happen is that if there is a disintegration of that representation, I don't think it's going to help in the long term. Um, I think uh, there's a lot of incentive for, for additional cooperation, but I don't like the direction it's taking because as an artist representative, you know, it's good to have organizations like ASCAP, you know, in the performing rights organizations, BMI, sure. even CSAC, um, is to, you know, to really create that leverage for a better result. I don't, I don't like to see that go away. And I, I don't know that the publishing company alone making separate deals are going to do much better for the artists. I hope so. But still, I think there's a trade-off.
Yeah, exactly. And so we're going to see those developments coming in in the next uh, few months. It's, yeah. take, it's taking a while to, to take its course, but uh, yeah, mm-hmm. keeping an eye on what's happening in New York uh, right now. And uh, uh, finally, I want to ask you about uh, you know, your own artists. Is there any artists that you'd like uh, our audience to go and check out uh, that, that you're working with and that you're excited about? Well, okay, here we are in Austin. So uh, there are artists that, uh, that uh, I'd like you to know about. One is Ruby Jane Smith. She's an artist from Austin, Texas. Uh, she's a savant fiddle player and singer songwriter um and we just found out that lady gaga who's performing here has asked her to perform with her as as a support musician wow so they were looking for a fiddle player and they identified her so that's a big day for her awesome there's another band from uh, austin called wild child and uh, they are working with ben queller's label he's also an artist from uh from austin wild child they have a new album this uh, released and uh, an exciting austin band as well that's fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much for your time, and uh, uh, I hope the the session goes well as well on interactive music. I'm, I'm sure it thank will. You. And uh, uh, thanks so much for for thank joining you. today. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest 2014. You can find everything on digitalmusictrends.com and the playlists on YouTube on YouTube.com/slash/digitalmusictrends. Hello everyone and welcome to the Digital Music Trends coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to be here with Paul uh, Fackler, a partner at uh, Aaron Fox LLP. So hi Paul and thanks for joining me. How's it going? Uh, Fantastic Andre, a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great. And so uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, your session that you had here at South by and some of the core issues that uh, you found uh, uh, that you're finding for for this year for, for digital music and music copyright. So first of all, what was the session about here at South by Southwest? So, the uh, fundamental premise of uh, the presentation that I gave as uh, someone who's been working in the digital music space for about 15 years, since really the the, the very beginning of it, is that now that we're 15 years into the existence of the streaming, digital music streaming service market, and we're at a point where not a single uh, player, not a single service has ever turned a profit on an annual basis, much less on a cumulative basis. I think it's it's very clear that the rates, the, the, the overall royalty burden that these services pay is unsustainable. It's been unsustainable and it continues to be unsustainable. So part of what I talked about in my presentation was uh, a little of the history because a lot of the people who are talking about these issues or thinking about these issues uh, don't seem to know all of the history of it. And right. it's, it's to understand where we are and where we're going. I'm um, a firm believer you got to first understand how we got here. Yeah, right? sure. Uh, so, so it all starts with the court, uh, rate courts, right? It all starts and the alpha and the omega of all of the problems are the rate courts, uh, particularly on the sound recording side. Yeah. Um, so uh, I gave a little overview of how particularly the, uh, well, uh, as a starting point, if you look at streaming services overall, uh, they're paying somewhere between typically 55 to 75 percent of their gross revenue in royalties yeah. for the music. Okay, it's hard to know. You know, be very precise because uh, on the sound recording side, the royalties are paid per play instead yeah. of our percentage of revenue, at least right now. Uh, and a lot of the companies are not public, and a lot of the companies only were in business for a couple of months before they went out under yeah. these burdens. Uh, but if you would look at the companies that are public or were public for a while, and if you look at the press reporting and, and things like that, you can figure out and do the math. It's it's some usually most services are in that range of 55 to 75. Although some interactive services have paid even higher than that yeah. uh, in particular periods. Uh, so uh, most of that royalty goes to the record companies. Okay, the the rates for the sound recording rights are much higher than they are for the music publishing oh, yeah. rights. Okay, uh, and the bottom line is, uh, you know, that's because of the way that the sound recording rights were set before the Copyright Royalty Board. Yeah. And I went through. There were a series of benchmarks. So when you and I litigate these rate cases, so it's a very arcane area of the copyright law, uh, and it's not for the faint of heart. I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, but you know, one of the key issues that drives really the most single most important issue that drives where the rates get set, and it even explains. Uh, sometimes you hear a discussion about uh, a concept, they call it platform parity or things like that, where there are certain services that pay at different rates than yeah. other services, like satellite and cable radio pay lower rates than webcasters, for example. Um, the key driver of those differences are the benchmark agreements that the Copper Royalty Board use as the starting point yeah. to set the rate. So. Uh, 
a series of very bad decisions coming out of the Copyright Royalty Board where every five years these proceedings happen where the rates get adjusted. Yeah. Uh, every five years the rates have gone up <laughs> and uh, they started very high and they just went up from there and always based on these uh, uh, benchmarks that were used. So. Um, if I'm right that the current rates are unsustainable, uh, then I sort of transitioned into a discussion of some key issues uh, that have come up in 2014 that are, presumably will be resolved in this year and over the next couple of years that uh, pose a threat to send the rates potentially even higher yeah. for digital music services. And of course, it's my thesis that uh, you know this is disastrous. Yeah. Right? So, so essentially, you know, where we're at right now is that the uh, sound recording, the, the master uh, uh, rates are pretty high, uh, especially compared to publishing. The publishers want to up those rates on the publishing side, and the master uh, owners, of course, don't want those rates to diminish. So, if the if the publishers got uh, uh, to have a co comparable rate to the master owners, that would essentially almost double the rates that are currently right now. So right, which means that the royalties payable would be, would be over even 100%. More unsustainable. Yes. Well, I, you know, nobody can pay more than 100% of their gross revenue, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so, so it's, uh, it's a difficult situation to be in. It is a difficult situation, and it's ironic because if you understand the history of how the rates were set for the sound recordings, one of the reasons that the rates were able to be set that high in the Copyright Royalty Board was expressly because the judges agreed with the record label's argument that the sound recording performance right is inherently much more valuable than the musical composition right, right? right? Because in the first digital music, mu when, when the first digital music services ever, right, were these cable radio services. They launched in the late 80s. Yeah. And they were, their, their launch and, and their, their existence is what led initially to, in the United States, for the first time, there even being a public performance right for sound recordings. Unlike the rest of the world, you know, the U.S. didn't recognize a copyright or a neighboring right or any other sort of federal right for sound recordings for the first hundred years of the existence of the record companies, yeah. right? So uh, in the first proceeding to set these uh, rates for digital cable at the time, the CARP, which was the predecessor entity to the copyright royalty judges, uh, but they basically did the same thing. They used the musical publishing rights, the PRO rates, right. ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, as the benchmark to set the sound recording rates. And they said, look, they're, they're inherently in a, in a non-interactive situation where you're right. not uh, substituting for the sale of records, the core business of the record companies, and it's really a discovery vehicle and all of these other things, right? There's no inherent reason to think that the rights to the publishing are worth, you know, different, you know, any more or less yeah. sound recording as a starting point. And that's why I think is usually 50-50, right? That is correct, because it's an ancillary revenue stream. And and when you're the, the entity who, who is trying to acquire the rights to play the sound recording, the, those are two copyrights that are just bundled together. They're wound up. You can't, neither one is, is usable without the other, right? So there are a lot of reasons uh, why... Uh, and, and in fact, there are rate courts, rate tribunals in the UK and in Canada yeah, sure. who set tariff rates for similar rights and yeah. have been doing so for a long time. And in the UK, apparently, they're even higher for internal radios, which makes uh, S Pandora, for example, uh, withdrew from the from the UK and hasn't uh, launched uh, again. <laughs> that is very true. I mean, look, there is a lot of messes involved with the European, you know, with the rights situation in Europe. Um, but what's interesting about that is putting aside the level of the rates, the relative rates for the sound recording and the musical compositions are considered equal, yeah. equivalent, okay? And in the rate decisions, the, the, the tribunals that set the rates always say, starting, and in fact, when they're litigating rates in these other countries, even the record labels and the uh, music publishers have agreed that yeah. the rates are, it's only in the United States where they've run this jive down, right? In the original, you know, once the first webcasting proceeding, because that's what happened. So the judges in the first digital music proceeding, they bought that. They said the rates should be equivalent. They, they rejected, RAAA argued specifically, well, sound recordings are inherently worth more, all this other stuff. Yeah. They rejected those arguments, and they, in fact, they set the sound recording license rate lower than the PRO rate in that proceeding. By the time that that proceeding was done with all the appeals and such, the first webcasting CARP be had begun. Right. 
And under the old CORP system, you every time there was a different proceeding, they would get three different ar new arbitrators to, to hear the case. And in that proceeding, they just reversed course. They said, All no, right. we're going to reject the PRO benchmark, yeah. and we're going to go with this wonderful, there was only one ultimately benchmark agreement left standing, and it, right. it was an agreement between Yahoo and, and RAAA that was horribly flawed. And that is ultimately what led to the rates being so much higher. So, so the irony is, the only reason the rates went higher for webcasters is that the, the CARP and then the, the Copper Early Board accepted the argument that the sound recording rates should be a vast multiple of the musical composition rates. Yeah. But now the publishers want to argue they should be equal, which is completely inconsistent with why the sound recording rates are so high. Yeah. And I, I, I guess it's a difficult debate to have because uh, uh, I know I understand artists uh, wanted to make as much money as possible, and, and, and you know labels, of course, and not just artists, uh, mostly labels wanted to make as much money as possible out of the sound recordings. Uh, but do you think that in the long run, if there was a, a, a slight lowering the rating that made services more sustainable, that would lead to a healthier ecosystem overall? There's no question because look, the, these businesses, no, like I said, no business, none of these businesses have ever made a profit on an annual basis, right? Uh, every once in a while, one will have a quarter, quarter right? yeah, like, it's but like, it's hey. meaningless. And you know, all the financial advisors jump up and down and cheer. And the they, stock goes up. <laughs> right, exactly. That's why they're cheering, right? Because it's always been an equity play for these yeah. companies, right? Whether it's going public or whether it's flipping the company, right? Uh, that has been what's been driving uh, uh, the businesses. And that doesn't make for a healthy system for consumers, uh, yeah. for artists or anything else. Yeah. And, and if these services go out of business, that money is not going to th is going to be lost to the record companies and the artists and the and the songwriters and the music publishers. It's not like record sales are going to go up. Yeah. If these streaming services go out of business, it's just not going to happen. And so let's talk about uh, the uh, current rate uh, issues that are happening uh, with ASCAP BMI and the digital rights. So that's a uh, that's a whole mess that I've been following for the last year or so. It's quite it's quite hard to explain because uh, you know I have quite a, a, a wide uh, audience and I try to make sure that that. That's an issue that is understandable, but uh, essentially we have an ongoing, two ongoing processes now going on in New York. Uh, one with ASCAP and one with BMI, which have to do with uh, uh, rates, but also have to do with whether those companies are able to withdraw their, uh, so some publishers are able to withdraw their digital rights uh, from those organizations without uh, uh, falling foul of the consent decree that was assigned uh, uh, that, that a long time ago, I guess. Uh, so uh, on that front, uh, you know, what are the latest developments? Uh, it's a very complicated issue. Issue, but if you if you can explain it to us in a in a simple way, that would be fantastic. <laughs> well, I, give it, I will give it a whirl. Okay, um, and in the simplest terms, it all just as all of these issues do, it comes down to money, right? So, as I was just discussing over the years, the the music publishing rates, um, the the ASCAP and BMI and and CSAC, you know, the performing rights for musical compositions, those rates have been relatively low. Okay for you have a long period of time where terrestrial radio you know has been paying those for many years they're paying in the low single digits i think right now they're paying around three and a half percent of revenue um for for the pro rights the digital services when they came on uh the ascap and bmi were able to get slightly higher rates out of the digital services but because of the rate court they weren't able to just come in and because of this history of terrestrial radio you know it's uh, they weren't able to get extremely high rates. So the, the digital services pay somewhere in the 5% of revenue yeah. for non-interactive digital music services, right? Uh, so, uh, and it's interesting, these rate courts that you were just discussing, and this is one of the key differences between the way rates are set on the sound recording side and the music publishing side. Uh, the, uh, the rate courts for the music publishers came out of these antitrust consent decrees that you were just discussing, right? And so there's this underlying understanding and they're set by federal judges who are very familiar with antitrust law, issues of competition, competitive markets. They're very uh, familiar with economic analyses, things like that. And, and so they have a starting point of, because of the consent decrees being essentially antitrust rulings, they come into rate court very concerned with making sure that the benchmarks used, that the rates are approximate rates that would occur in a competitive marketplace, which doesn't exist for music licensing. It's very important to understand this, that there's no such thing as a true competitive market because 
the rights that you have to acquire as a music service don't substitute for one another. So it's not a question of, oh, if ASCAP gives me a better rate, I'm going to go with ASCAP and not get a BMI license. You have to get all three of them because copyrights are not fungible. The, the music is not fungible. And, and uh, you know, so the rate court uh, has over time, every time the labels have gone in and tried to jack up the rates for the digital music services, the rate courts have said, you know, hold your horses, that's not gonna happen. We're gonna keep them nice and stable. Yeah. So, in the, on the other side, with the sound recordings, the music publishers have watched the record companies go to the Copyright Royalty Board. Yeah. The Copyright Royalty Board, because it's not the product of an antitrust consent decree, but really uh, is a product of the Copyright Act itself, my view, having litigated in, the, in these cases and certainly read all of the decisions that have come out, at least under the original set of three judges, it was very clear that they were not interested in doing any searching analysis of whether the marketplace was competitive and when benchmarks were introduced, whether there was undue market power that explained high rates that were in some of these direct licenses that were used as benchmarks. Uh, so. Uh, that was the difference. Now the music publishers are watching every five years, the sound recording rates are getting higher and higher. The music publishing rates are staying lower. And, you know, understandably from a business, purely short term business perspective, at least, they don't like that. Their answer, of course, is not to lower the sound recording rates to eliminate that disparity, yeah. which I would argue is the only rational thing you can do. Their argument is to raise the publishing rates. Yeah. The problem is, as I said, the rate court wasn't allowing them to do that that well. So they came up with a, uh, their only way to do this was to get out from under the rate court. And they've been pretty transparent about this in their public, uh, you know, the music publishers, uh, BMI and, and ASCAP, when they've made public statements about this, um, they came up with this idea that some of the major publishers to change the rules, the membership rules for ASCAP and BMI, so that they could do what I'm, what I would call selective withdrawals. So they could withdraw their music from the ASCAP and BMI repertories, but only for certain types of licensees. They want to keep their music in ASCAP and BMI. For because it makes them money. <laughs> well, not only does it make them money, yeah. but it, there are huge benefits to everybody yeah. from ASCAP and BMI. Okay, uh, the, the blanket licenses, you know, for, for licensees, obviously it means you don't have to go around to a, a thousand different copyright owners, you know, and negotiate licenses. But it's even more beneficial for the copyright owners because, you know, Sony EMI does not want to hire uh, you know, they're firing people, they're condensing, they're certainly not job creators at this yeah. point, right? <laughs> they're, jo they're job eliminators, right, to maintain their profitability. So Marty Bandier can keep smoking those big cigars that he loves to carry in all of the pictures when he's on the cover of Billboard and, you know, all, all of that. Uh, so uh, the, 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 uh, if you if if you have, uh, and Sony uh, EMI was one of the, the first to really start pushing for this process. Yeah. So the idea is, uh, you know, Sony EMI doesn't want to be in the business of going out to every bar, restaurant, uh, you know, negotiating with terrestrial radio, yeah. with television. This this is a lot of work, and it would take a lot of people to replicate what EMI, uh, what ASCAP, I'm sorry, and BMI do very efficiently. Yeah. Okay, so uh, that's why it has to be this partial withdrawal. But at the same time, uh, the partial withdrawal would also be uh, impact negatively on. Uh, smaller publishers and independent artists that are with ASCAP and BMI because it lowers their bargaining power when it comes to doing the same thing, right? Exactly right, because if it, the purpose of the selective withdrawal, of course, is so that for the digital services, they now have to go and get direct licenses from the major music publishers. Because, as I mentioned before, similar to with the record companies, these copyrights are not in competition. There's no co competition in that market. The, the copyright owners enjoy absolute pricing power. The market power, and this gets back into the whole reason for the consent decrees and the antitrust concerns, they can demand any rates they want because you're, you have no other choice. You have to pay what they want or go out of business. So uh, right now, uh, what I'm seeing are three potential outcomes. So number one, uh, the c copyright owners uh, win uh, completely and the rates get uh, sent up. and. Uh, publishers cannot withdraw the digital rights. Number two is that uh, the pub big publishers are allowed to withdraw digital rights and do direct licenses. Uh, number three is that uh, they come out to some sort of agreement to uh, lower somewhat the, the, the general 
well lower actually no I, I don't know what the third option would be actually it's kind of <laughs> I was trying to, to rationalize this but it's uh, like I'm trying to figure out a, a scenario where the big publishers would stay with uh, uh, ASCAP and BMI and be happy with that deal instead of having to be uh, made to stay uh, by a court well, they're never going to be happy with the deal, right? right. Because they're not, they, they, they've made it very they have clear. All the good, they have all the good tracks. They <laughs> they have, the big right. tracks. I, I mean, <laughs> the only thing that will make them happy is when they're also getting 50% of revenue. So the services are paying 50% to the record companies and 50% to them, right? Which is very short sighted because everybody will be out of business. Yeah. Um, but what happened, uh, oddly, the, the wrinkle that happened in the, in the ASCAP and BMI, the Pandora cases, where this issue finally came uh, up to the judges and they had to rule on it. Uh, in the ASCAP court, Judge Cote decided that that attempt to selectively withdraw violated the consent decree, so it was ineffective, with the result that all of the uh, pu withdrawing publishers' music is still in the ASCAP repertory. Yeah. Th but then, a month or so later, in the BMI court, Judge Stanton agreed that it violated the consent decree, but he then said the consequence of that was he was essentially rewriting the withdrawals so that they effectively withdrew for entirely so that yeah. all of the withdrawing publishers music was now out of the BMI repertory for any new licenses that came up. That was not, as we discussed before, what the publishers had in mind, yeah. right? right? So this happened right before Christmas. A few months of chaos ensued and m almost all of the withdrawing publishers have already now returned to, to BMI, yeah. right? In the interim. So what happens now, right? Um, First of all, there will obviously be an appeal to the Second Circuit of both of those decisions. I, I don't think there's any question that the Second Circuit is going to affirm that those partial withdrawals violate the consent decree. I right. don't think there's almost no chance that ASCAP or BMI will prevail on appeal on those issues. Um, however, what ASCAP and BMI have announced is, you know, they're currently negotiating with the Department of Justice to try to get the consent decree changed right. to allow this. So now we're talking about lobbying right behind the scenes closed doors smoky rooms yep. all that good stuff <laughs> they're also lobbying from what they say to get the consent decrees gotten rid of entirely right so there'd be no rate court for anything anymore which they would love to have happen right because because right. no, then they can exercise all of that market power um one interesting development just from last week that calls into question how successful they might be we haven't been talking about csec the third PRO here in, in the United States, right? The, because they don't have a consent decree and they're historical. I mean, they've always been much smaller. And back in the 1940s, 1950s, when these consent decrees went into place and rate courts were developed, uh, CSAC, the type of music that they uh, controlled was not as commercially relevant. That's right. changed significantly over the years. While they're still a much smaller catalog, they have some key songwriters. So you always have to get a CSAC license, right? Um, Oh, CSAC actually have rights themselves. I didn't even know that. Oh, oh well, they're they're like ASCAP and BMI. They they yeah. they represent. Oh, CSAC. Sorry, yeah. CSAC. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thought... No, not CSAC. Right. Oh, okay. No, yeah, not yeah, the yeah. Other, okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Like the alphabet soup. <laughs> with an S. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> I'm with you now. <laughs> got it. So uh, so what has happened is uh, there have been two civil antitrust lawsuits filed yeah. against CSAC here in the United States uh, by the radio uh, negotiating committee and the television negotiating committee. And just a couple of weeks ago, uh, in the television case in the Southern District of New York, where it's pending, CSEC made a summary judgment motion, a motion to just get rid of the case after discovery, saying there were no antitrust claims. The judge rejected that motion. He held that the plaintiffs had adduced sufficient evidence that a jury could find antitrust violations right. in the blanket licensing, uh, and it's now going to have to go to trial. So the interesting question in this whole dynamic is, if in fact CSAC, the much smaller PRO, winds up subject to some sort of rate court oversight, how successful are ASCAP and BMI, the much bigger ones, going to be in arguing we don't need rate courts anymore? Right. So those are those are the questions, and I think <laughs> we're just going to have to wait and see. I mean, I'm certainly hopeful that you know uh, things work out such that you know everybody stays in ASCAP and BMI. We continue to have rate court oversight because if those rates go up the way that the publishers will push them up, if they if if services have to direct license them, uh, everybody's out of business. It's right. gone. Well, Paul, this was a uh, super fascinating, and uh, you know, where can people find out? Uh, do you have a website where you have some uh, 
some bits and bobs about about this uh, this these latest developments. I, yeah. I do from time to time. I have a blog at uh, title17.net. Um, also, uh, from time to time, I publish on my firm's website on the right. Errant Fox uh, website, which you can find at errantfox.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, so it's something I never got tired of talking about, as you That's might awesome. have uh, <laughs> seen. You may have to edit this down considerably. No, 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 you, know. <laughs> YouTube is good, is good for that. You can uh, put well, anything up. You know, one other thing I'll throw in, and, sure. uh, uh, just in case, uh, quickly, you're interested, because it's something that's not getting a lot of coverage, yeah. but also has, is a huge potential minefield, is the problem here in the United States of pre-1972 sound recordings. Right. Okay, so the, the bottom line is because of the way that the sound recording copyright developed here in the United States, where I mentioned for the first hundred years there wasn't any, yeah. it, when they finally created a sound recording copyright, they only made it prospective, not retrospective, right? So it only applies to sound recordings that were created after February 15, on 1972, a level. on the federal level. Yeah. Pre-1972 sound recordings are protected, if at all, by a patchwork of state laws. Right, but those state laws have always been construed as being essentially anti-piracy laws. Right. Okay. So to prevent uh, parties from just making rip-off copies of sound recordings and selling them in competition with the record companies, there's never been a ruling that there's there's a public performance right. Sure. Because think about it: if there were, terrestrial radio has been infringing for a hundred years. Yeah. Right. So, uh, however, now the digital companies always get special treatment, right? So Sirius XM has five lawsuits pending right now against it, okay? The RAAA sued it, claiming it's infringing because, bec I should say, because they're not covered by federal copyright, they're also not included in the compulsory license, the statute and the Copyright yeah. Act, okay? That's what creates this problem. So RAAA has sued Sirius XM, Sound Exchange has sued SiriusXM for not paying for these recordings under the compulsory license, even though it's not covered. So it's, you know, heads we win, tails you lose, which it always is with the record companies. Yeah. And then there are three class actions that have been filed in California, New York, and Florida. Uh, in the nominative plane of his uh, 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 Flo and Eddie of the Turtles. But yeah. in any event, you have these cases, and it's a huge problem. I, I predict it's going to be as big of a problem for the record companies as it is for the services, though. They've opened a can of worms uh, because the way it works is if you take an old uh, 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 an album that was released prior to 1972 and you uh, merely digitize it, okay? So even when it, when it was time to, to release CDs in the yeah. 80s, right? If you just put it out on CD and you remastered it digitally, without changing, remixing it, or changing any of the EQ, or doing anything to it, it's still a pre-72 sound recording. But yeah. if you do any of those things, if you go back to the multi-track masters and do a remix, if you, uh, you know, if you, it, re yeah. well, if you EQ it, if you do something so it sounds in any way different, you've created a whole new copyright. Yeah. And in fact, back when the CDs first came out, the record companies would routinely register the copyrights as new copyrights yeah. claiming that they remixed these albums even when in a lot of instances they hadn't precisely because they wanted to claim federal copyright in these old recordings the only way to tell whether a sound recording in the digital world some file that they get served by the record companies you know to put on these services is truly in a copyright sense pre-72 or post-72 is to get an old copy of the vinyl yeah load it you know digitize it and then do a spectral analysis a waveform analysis there's ways of doing it and i've done it in litigation when i was dealing with a small number of recordings and we were arguing over they were pre-72 or not um i can guarantee you the record companies don't even know which of their recordings you know the digital files are truly pre-72 post-72 for the digital music services there's no way for them to tell it's a right. it's an impossible trap so uh i uh, this is going to be, a, when you hear the, the parties arguing about this, they all talk about, well, the album was released before 7. That does not give you the answer under the copyright law. So once these all finally get litigated, this is going to be a huge mess. <laughs> and what's the end game, right? That's yeah. the question. What's the end game? Because if the record companies were right and, and there is the state law performance right, 
they have the ability to put any music service that uses the compulsory license, the non-interactive services, right. out of business. Because they've all, nobody, I'm not aware of any digital music service that uses the compulsory license that has separate direct licenses for pre-72. Sure. On the other hand, if they don't choose not to put them out of business and they just, you know, they're going to offer a license. And if so, does that 55 to 75% of revenue now go up because there's a whole <laughs> new license that you have to get, right? So that's another little tidbit that not a lot of folks are talking about and Absolutely. thinking about, yeah. but um, it's an important one. <laughs> uh, Paul, thanks so much for your time. It was a real pleasure talking to you today. The pleasure is mine, Andrea. And thanks for watching the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends. Hello everyone and welcome to DMT's coverage of South by Southwest 2014 and it's a real pleasure today to have uh, Greg uh, Barnes uh, from uh, uh, General Counsel at uh, DEMA. So hi Greg and thanks for joining me. How's it going? It's going pretty good. I'm enjoying my time down here in South by Southwest. Uh, a lot of things to see, a lot of people to bump into, a lot of good conversations about the music industry. Yeah, and so uh, I mentioned to you in the prep that unfortunately I had, a, I had an interview with uh, Lee Knife from your organization last year that uh, had a massive technical glitch, so it didn't quite come off the ground. So I really look forward to, to talking to you today. And so first off, uh, what is Dima and what, what you do? Well, Dima represents uh, a lot of... Um, I would say, to be, to be a little humble, we represent the leading online distributors of digital content. Uh, so if you're a connoisseur of ebooks, uh, more than likely you interact with uh, one of our member companies. If you purchase music downloads or you like to stream music, you probably interact with one of our companies. Same thing holds true with respect to video. Nowadays, people are renting movies online, digital copies of movies online. A lot of people are subscribing to monthly uh, streaming services. Uh, and, and we represent those guys as well. What we do are a couple things uh, as a trade association. We advocate before Congress for changes in the legislative landscape that make for a more conducive um, and innovative experience one for consumers but also to be honest for distributors for the companies that we represent uh, we also kind of um, weigh in before federal agencies and we make appearances before federal courts all on behalf of our industry Sure. And so there's a bunch of issues that are, uh, you know, uh, up for uh, debate at the moment in, in the U.S., especially when it comes to copyright and all of that. So first up, let's touch upon, uh, you know, the copyright review that was uh, sort of outlined uh, uh, last year by Maria Palante around, uh, uh, you know, just, just after this time. It was uh, not, not a year ago yet, but uh, uh, coming up to it. So what's yeah. happening on that front? Uh, it's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, let, let's start at the, at the, you know, at the beginning. You, you're right. About a year ago, Maria Plente, as part of her um, annual speech before, I believe, it was Columbia University, she talked about, you know, the next great copyright act. I think that was the title of the speech. And and, and through that speech, she went through a a whole list of. Um, reforms or updates that should be made to the copyright law that would actually bring it into this you know this modern current environment that we're in and and we at DEMA can't be more supportive of the notion of updating the law because we do feel like it, 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 many of these laws were written the last time the, the the body itself was written was in 1976 since then there have been some minor tweaks and revisions but over the, for the most part there hasn't been a major overhaul and so we really look forward to that opportunity uh, since then not much has happened though what what we've seen and, and there are a few positive things but the few things we've seen is um, Congress has had a series of hearings on various uh, type rock related issues. Today, as a matter of fact, they're talking about the DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, Section 512 of that, which deals with the notice and takedown process. Um, which needs some, uh, some reviewing that. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, I think it depends on who you ask how much work needs to be done there. Um, copyright owners have expressed some concern about um, the repeated notices that need to be sent um, for um, identical fringing yeah. works um, and service providers have voiced some concern about um, over-inclusive notices and or um, inaccurate notices yeah. and so that's placed a certain burden on them as well so I guess yeah there has been at least some concerns of, but how you go forward and how you reform that process yeah. I think there hasn't been any type of uh, consensus around that 
Yeah, sure. One of the big uh, things that's happening right now in the court, in the New York courts, really, is, is the rates battles and uh, talking about you know uh, negotiations around compulsory licenses, uh, what the rates should be. You know, there's some publishers that want to pull out their digital rights from uh, ASCAP and BMI and do direct deals with providers like Pandora. It's, it's a bit of a mess. You know, I, I've covered this field quite quite a bit, so people that have followed the shows, they they have an idea of what's going on because uh, I've, I've tried to explain it as much as possible. But in your view, you know, what are the key, the core issues there, and uh, is there a potential resolution that is outside of court or are we going to have to see a resolution through court on that? It's a good question. Uh, the key is money. <laughs> That's <laughs> it's, it's a, <laughs> let's just simplify it. It's all about money. Uh, right now we, as you know, when we're, when we're trying to figure out rates for the public performance of musical compositions, we turn to one of the three leading PROs, uh, one of the three PROs in this country, ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. And uh, based upon, at least with respect to ASCAP and BMI, based upon the consent decree that operates here in the U.S., you know, it, it, we're granted a blanket license and we are guaranteed to be able to license uh, content based upon a reasonable royalty. Yeah. What, what is happening now is you do see individual publishers withdrawing from that process because they actually want to increase the rate in which they receive from um, online distributors. Yeah. Our concern, I mean, is, is pretty straightforward. I mean, we feel like if the, the current process provides a reasonable royalty, our question is kind of like, well, what are you looking for? I mean, are you looking for something unreasonable? Um, because by definition, you're already getting something reasonable. And so, yeah, you're right. It is a mess. Um, that's why you see Pandora, which is not within the demon membership, but you know, we have um, very similarly closely aligned interest going to court trying to actually fight for a reasonable royalty and, and you see publishers saying we don't we want to withdraw from the process altogether yeah yeah sure and uh, looking at uh, some of the other issues that are happening i mean one of the key things that i was excited about last year uh was the global repertoire database announcement and, and what was happening around that and the fact that we're finally going to get an index of uh, uh, a body of works in the music industry that was uh, recognized internationally and was going to work out uh, you know at least uh, who owned what and you know make it a bit more straightforward so but uh, the project uh, since then at least from the latest I hear, is, is hitting some stumbling blocks. So uh, are you disappointed about that? And, and why, what's your take on it? Yeah, we are disappointed. We at DEMA, as a matter of fact, I spoke um, Tuesday of this week. These days are starting to run together. Tuesday, I spoke on a panel um, in Washington, D.C. about orphan works. And one of the things that we stress, again, as royalty paying online distributors of content, it's really important for us to be able to identify and locate the owners of copyrights. I mean, if 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 we're a company out there, or we represent multiple companies, and we're interested in using this work and paying the copyright owner, the whole system breaks down if we can't find that person. Um, I think the copyright owner loses out on money that or yeah. revenues that they could have collected. Distributors, you know, as a business, our businesses aren't as attractive because yeah. we don't have as many copyrights to actually distribute. And um, from the consumer perspective, and let's let's I can't emphasize the consumer perspective enough. I mean, this whole system is about making sure that these works are then distributed and so that people can enjoy them. And they lose out because then they can't enjoy them legally and, and my companies are not going to distribute content illegally. Yeah. You asked specifically about the, the database. I don't do as much with that directly, but it is my understanding. I don't want to point fingers, but I was talking to uh, uh, a relatively large um, company that operates in this space everybody knows uh, them very well and I and I've, I understand that you know some of the organizations that had agreed to actually pay for the um, construction of the database decided that they were not willing to pay and so I think that's slowed down the process a bit that's I don't want to name names no, here. sure of course yeah, yeah. It's, uh, no, it's a shame because you know this is a sorely needed uh, thing and if if they it can solve a lot of problems and uh, you know it's it's certainly not something that is going to be government funded so somebody's going to have to fund it at some point <laughs> no no gov yeah government's not going to fund it yeah because it's uh <laughs> it's private property essentially you know right. copyright material so that's uh, that's going to be an interesting fight and so there were a couple of uh, interesting issues that you you talked about on on the dima site uh, in the last uh, couple of months so mm -hmm. now first of all the songwriter equity act uh, yeah. so what's that all about for people that haven't uh, haven't heard about this uh, well, the, the bill does a couple of things. Um, it, the, the first thing, it changes the rate setting standard uh, that we currently use for the mechanical license. So, um, 
I don't know if I need to unpack that for your audience a little bit, maybe, little maybe bit, yeah. just a little bit. Okay, great. So let, let's just take an online music store. So online music store, and they, be, before I even get there, let me back up. So every song has two copyrights attached to it. One is the sound recording, the other is the musical composition. So whenever one of my member companies is trying to make use of a song, they have to pay two copyright owners for the most part. Sometimes they wear two hats, but in general, you have to make two payments. When you're thinking about uh, trying to buy a purchase a music download, uh, so same thing holds true. That online music store has to pay for the reproduction or distribution of the musical composition, and they also have to pay the owner for the reproduction and distribution of the sound recording. Yeah. Um, here in the U.S., there's this provision in the Copyright Act, Section 115, that determines uh, the rate. There's a rate setting standard that we use that determines how much we have to pay for the reproduction and distribution of the composition. We actually go and sit down directly with the labels to actually figure out how much we have to pay for the reproduction and distribution of the sound recording. Under existing law, the rate setting standard is what we here have kind of dubbed the 801B standard yeah. because it's a four-factor test outlined in Section 801B of Title 17. That bill, uh, the Songwriter Equity Act you mentioned, it would change that standard from the 801B standard to a willing buyer, willing seller standard. And we've expressed some concerns as distributors about that. On its face, it sounds good. Willing buyer, willing seller. The problems are you know, two or three fold. Main problem is you're, you're only talking about one willing seller, you know, but multiple willing buyers. Automatically, if you think about that in economic terms, you then end up with a higher rate because there's not people competing on the higher end in terms of pricing. There are only people competing on the lower end. Bigger companies, obviously, in terms of a willing buyer will pay more, but then there are a lot of small companies who are willing buyers that will pay a lot less. But the, the, the top line then gravitates towards the willing seller rate. So we're concerned for that reason. And we also have empirical evidence. When you look at that standard, the willing buyer, willing seller standard, it's codified an existing law under section 114 of the copyright act right so that's so now i'm getting into non-interactive internet radio so when you're a webcaster and you're trying to figure out how much you have to pay you go through a 114 crb process and it's under the willing buyer willing seller standard yeah. i can't say this emphatically enough it has been a disaster for the internet radio business i mean what you see now is if you just go back five to ten years ago, you see multiple large companies operating in this space, the 114 space, trying to figure out how to build new businesses, how to reward copyright owners. Many of them have left the business, and Pandora is by far the largest who still operates under the 114 license. There are still some smaller companies that do that, but most of them operate outside of 114 and they do on-demand streaming, which isn't eligible for the 114 license. Right. Yeah. So this essentially, I mean, it, it, it's a big debate, right? Isn't it? Uh, whether uh, you know, it's the rates are, are causing the economic problems of the, of the companies, or whether uh, you know, I, I hear from also a lot of labels that say, well, actually, they should find a way to make more money and be able to pay more. So it's just it's just a really tricky debate, isn't it, on, on that front? Oh gosh, you, <laughs> we're going to probably have to edit this part out. Um, <laughs> I'm I'm always intrigued when I hear the record labels suggest um, ways for my companies to um, better monetize yeah. <laughs> their business models. Okay, so I think I've said it in a more elegant way, so good. So, because I could have gone a very snarky route, but our companies spend on a daily basis an incredible amount of time of trying to figure out how you can bring to market attractive products that consumers are willing to pay for the notion that we are intentionally leaving money on the table, like, oh no, there's a lot more money that can be made out there, and, and no, my companies don't want to make the money, I mean, it's, it's somewhat absurd. The, the fact of the matter is, top rate owners don't appreciate is, the internet has leveled the playing field, the internet demands efficiency, pricing efficiency, and what you have is you have a lot of owners who still have kind of these flashbacks to the analog world where there probably was a lot more anti-competitive monopolistic pricing taking place. That's been eliminated by and large um, because of the internet. Uh, and the other thing that's changed that they don't fully appreciate is there's so many 
distractions that exist now that didn't exist years ago. Used to be music consumed most people's leisure time. Yeah. Now you have social gaming. Now you have things like Facebook. You have things like Twitter. You have things as a person who now is leaving the young generation starting to <laughs> go a little bit older. You have all these apps, you know, that, that take people's time away from music, take people's time away from video. And so they're not willing to pay as much for some of those other things as they were back when it consumed the vast majority of their leisure time. So it's those things that I think copyright owners aren't willing to understand and or accept. Yeah, it's sure. a nice way of answering your question. I think, I'm glad, I'm glad I, I did it in a better no, you, way. You, you swung it really well, so that's great. If you had to pick uh, one uh, hot topic for 2014 uh, for Dima uh, when it comes to the music space, uh, what would it be? Uh, I, I would say Section 115 reform, reforming the mechanical license. Right. Yeah, I, I think that is still a process by which it's very tedious for us to license the right for musical compositions. I think we've also talked about um, expanding it maybe to cover interactive streaming. Right. Um, so again, as I mentioned uh, a second ago, you do have interactive radio, the Spotify, the Rhapsodies of the World, Slacker has uh, interactive service. Right now, they're not eligible for a compulsory license because they don't meet the Section 114 non-interactive definition. Yeah. And, you know, Section 115, if you follow the black letter writing of that, that section, it only talks about digital um, DPDs. So, so what we're thinking is it would be good if we updated Section 115 um, or added a new section. I don't, I'm not saying it has to go necessarily in that section of, of the Copyright Act, but if there was some way to make sure that interactive streaming was covered under compulsory license. That's actually interesting because I was talking about that yesterday in respect to the fact that Beats uh, Music came out with, uh, uh, you know, saying that they're going to pay the same rates to all rights holders, which is an interesting development and also something that hasn't been seen before because we all know that Spotify has different deals with labels, uh, with majors that it has with independents and, and with the, with the smaller artists. And so, so in that sense, would that completely change the game of, uh, of, of payments as well? Well, I don't, I don't know enough about the Beats process, but let me, let me say this, um, speaking a, a little bit about artist compensation and money flows. It, it is sure. one of the subjects that we, we try to educate members of Congress on because, again, a lot of these arguments go back to money compensation. When a service like Spotify, which I think people have really read about that and there's been a lot of uh, published reports about how they compensate artists. A couple things are important to know. One, to launch that service, the interactive service, because they had to do direct deals outside of the compulsory license, they actually gave up an equity in the service itself. What that percentage is, I don't know. Some reports have said as much as 20%. Could be less, could be more. Don't know for sure. That 20%, I'm told, doesn't go to artists. It actually is held within the record labels and they do whatever they, they wish or decide to do. Uh, maybe fund new projects, so maybe it does go to up and coming artists, but yeah. it, it, it does, it's not tied to streaming, put it that way. And then on the back end, what happens is, obviously uh, Spotify does pay a certain rate per stream to the labels. Um, how that money is divvied up is really de determined by the record label and the contract that they have. Um, so even when you hear a beat say, oh, we're going to pay artists the same thing. If they use an intermediary, you don't really know for sure if artists are actually receiving compensation. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. On equal, well, I just want to, because people read that and they think, oh, yeah, well, Beast is just giving, you know, if you're Lady Gaga or if you're Rihanna, you all get the same amount. That's not necessarily the case because no, it's tied it to the record the contract label. that you exactly. signed, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 for sure. And that's uh, that's really interesting. And, and, and I'm sorry, before, I yeah, just sure, don't want to cut you off, but the, the, the one thing I'll say is it's, it's another reason why we argue for the compulsory license. The one thing we've heard from um, musicians, large and small, is the 114 license awards a lot more transparency than you get in the direct licensing process. Under the section 114, you know if you're a company like Pandora, you pay a certain rate per performance, that money goes to Sonic Exchange, 50% of the money in Sonic Exchange has to go um, to the record label, and then the other 50% is shared between recording artists 
backup uh, feature vocalists and musicians. Yeah. Uh, and so th that's interesting actually because uh, uh, we're only going to see really what happens uh, uh, with the equity stakes uh, for the first time uh, once uh, and if Spotify goes uh, public this year. And I think uh, at that point we're going to see a lot of backlash from, from artists that realize the valuation of the company and realize the equity stake that uh, labels have uh, because I guess some of those filings are going to have to be made public uh, uh, as far as uh, equity stakes are concerned. And so if artists see that uh, you know, uh, a Universal or a, or a Sony have made you know, a billion dollars over the uh, Spotify going public, they're going to start thinking, oh well, w why am I not getting any money out of this? The valuation is really based on, on the value of my catalog and that's why you managed to get an equity stake in, in the company in the first place. So, so I think there's going to be some interesting times ahead. I, I think you're absolutely right and I think my argument for a at least exploring the possibility of a compulsory license in the context of interactive streaming is uh, it's going to be boosted tremendously. I think then you actually have an artist saying maybe we should look at this because then again we get more transparency from the process that we don't get right now. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you. And uh, where can people find out more about Dima and uh, re read up some of the material? Yeah, so our website is www.digmedia. Uh, digital is abbreviated, so it's digmedia.org. Um, we we try and update the website as often as possible but you know we're even though we're a technology trade association sometimes we get you know bogged down with other things but sure. you can you can read about our press releases our statements read about what our companies are doing um, we try to even offer some kind of light more entertainment stuff where we list the hottest like downloads we list the hottest viral videos cool. i mean we really try to serve as the ambassador for the digital media industry be it digital music be it uh, movies or books that's great. Well, thank you so much for your time. It was a pleasure. Thank you. It was a pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thanks. And thanks for listening to the DMT coverage of South by Southwest. You can find out everything on digitalmusictrends.com or on youtube.com slash digitalmusictrends.